Our next speaker in this session is uh, Michael Beerer from the MGH Cancer Center, and the title of his talk is Prospects for Targeted Therapy and Ovarian Cancer. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Oh, okay, good. Well, let me start by thanking the organizers of the meeting, particularly Bruce, for inviting me here. It's wonderful to be able to walk right across the street and uh, end up in a, in a uh, very nice venue like this. When I actually was doing my internship and residency, this was a functioning jail. I think it's gotten a little better, I'm not sure. Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, there are my uh, conflicts are listed. And the topic today is uh, prospects of targeting uh, therapies for ovarian cancer. And I would hope that you'll come away uh, with the idea being that ovarian cancer may in fact be a little bit different and there are some specific challenges to this tumor. But in the end, I think there, with some creative uh, ways and the right molecules, uh, we'll be able to do that. Unfortunately, this is the way most of our patients present. It's a 57-year-old woman with uh, about three and a half to four liters of malignant ascites and a tumor that weighed about eight or nine pounds. Um, she underwent exploratory laparotomy, and unfortunately, most of the time, this is what we see. This is the omentum being opened up high up in the uh, abdomen, which is just filled with uh, ovarian uh, cancer cells. Um, and this is the challenge in this tumor. Um, 75% of patients present with advanced stage disease, upper abdomen or outside the abdomen. The good news is it's highly responsive uh, to chemotherapy. In fact, I would submit it may be the um, highest responsive tumor to chemotherapy of all uh, epithelial cancers, even higher than breast. Uh, unfortunately, the vast majority of patients eventually relapse uh, and develop drug-resistant disease. We've done extremely well in pushing the median survival of these patients out to four to five years, but if you really look at where the curves grow, go, the overall survival of this cancer has not changed much over 30 years. 15,000 deaths per year in this country makes it the fourth most frequent cause of cancer death in women in the United States, and it has the highest case fatality rate of all GYN cancers, primarily because it presents in late stage. All patients are treated with surgery and chemotherapy. That is the state of the art uh, as of 2012. This is a uh, timeline of um, development of the combination chemotherapy for this tumor, and there are a couple highlights I'd like to point out. Um, back when I was actually relatively young, uh, early 90s, uh, platinum burst on the seam actually earlier than that, but eventually cytoxin and cisplatin became the standard of care in the early 90s. This was then replaced by taxol cisplatinum with GOG-111. That was based upon a survival advantage to the combination. And then GOG-158 demonstrated that carboplatinum could be given easier, less toxic uh, than cisplatinum and was equally efficacious, and that became the standard of care. Note that smack in the middle of 2000, targeted therapies make their appearance. Uh, we can go way out here to 2012, and yet the standard of care for ovarian cancer is still carboplatin um, and taxol chemotherapy. And so that begs the question as to um, why exactly hasn't targeted therapies changed the standard of care in this particular tumor? Now, I can demonstrate to you why by giving you reams and reams of trials and studies uh, that are essentially negative. I won't do that. It's painful and it's boring, but I'll give you an example of what the field experienced um, when targeted therapies first uh, came around. So I'd like to focus on the uh, EGFR signaling pathway, and you probably have all seen this. I'm not going to belabor it with four receptors and multiple signal transduction pathways downstream. Um, this was a very exciting uh, development because there were small molecule inhibitors that targeted various areas here. There were antibodies. And we knew that ovarian cancer, at least 70% of them overexpressed EGFR. Another maybe 20 or 30% were reported to have amplification overexpression of HER2 nu. And so this was really quite exciting. Uh, and although this slide is old, it makes the point. These are the initial trials using uh, EGFR1 inhibitors. These are small molecule TKI inhibitors and an antibody. And I'll just draw your attention to recurrent ovarian cancer. The response rates here are dismal. 0 to 6 percent. Now, one could argue that, well, perhaps we're not treating the right patients. Maybe we need to be more selective. And so I demonstrate to you a trial done by the GOG. It wasn't so well to remember the number, but I can't. Um, but this was done by Mike Bookman and published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology now 
multiple years ago, they screened 830 patients to find the 90 patients that had 2 plus, 3 plus staining for hair too new. They were entered on trial. Approximately 50 of them were valuable, and the response rate to Herceptin was um, about 7.5%. Again, not a home run. Uh, it actually effectively um, eliminated the further exploration of Herceptin in ovarian cancer. Now, an alternative theory was, well, perhaps this whole axis isn't really um, supporting the proliferation of ovarian cancer cells, but maybe just maintaining their survival. And so these are essentially static drugs. And that theory led to a randomized phase three trial on erlopinib as a consolidation slash maintenance therapy. This trial was complete and presented at this year's ASCO. It's not published yet, uh, but I will show you the data. Patients were treated up front with classic combination chemotherapy and surgery. They were in a CR and they were randomized to two years of erlopinib therapy versus observation. I don't need a statistician to tell me there's not much difference uh, in survival between those two curves. And so you're looking at about 10, 11 years of um, multiple trials, I haven't even summarized all of them, uh, of so-called targeted therapy in this disease, um, which um, essentially um, has shown uh, no even hint uh, that this axis can be exploited for the treatment of ovarian cancer. So the question becomes then, why is this? The target is there. It may not be there quite as clear as other tumors or in breast cancer where hair 2 new is um, amplified to 30, 40, 50 copies. But nevertheless, these, these targets are there. Um, and in fact, there are lots of other targets. Every time I open a journal, I see more and more targets for ovarian cancer. Um, some of these are even from my lab. I get a publication out of it but I'm not so sure how clinically relevant these are going to be. And with these targets, there's certainly lots of agents. We've got, um, as I said, EGFR, epigenetics, mTOR, IGFR, and of course, a whole host of anti-angiogenic agents. But the question learned, or I should say, the question that comes out from the early trials is, is there something different about ovarian cancer in terms of how we have to think about targeted therapies? And I would submit to you, there probably is. This emphasizes that point. This is the GOG-170 series. Now, what is that? That is recurrent ovarian cancers, mostly resistant to platinum, but some sensitive patients are in here. And you're looking at phase two, single-arm phase two trials, with a variety of, shall we say, small molecule inhibitors targeted therapies. This has been graphed in a way that you're looking at response rate on the axis and PFS on the ordinate. And the idea is that some of these agents may be cytostatic, so PFS would be an important endpoint. The key here is you want to be in the upper right quadrant. You don't see too many trials up there. In fact, the response rates on most of these in this patient population is less than 10%. There's a smidgen of perhaps prolongation of PFS like with, with uh, serafinib, but these results are very, very disappointing. Um, and again, the question is, is there something unique or different about ovarian cancer? So work done by uh, a series of labs, including my own, on the genomics of ovarian cancer, culminating in a very large study uh, called Cancer Genome Atlas, I think suggests at least part of the reason why this is going to be different and a little more challenging. So there were about 480 uh, serous cancers, high grade, tested in uh, Cancer Genome Atlas on multiple genomic platforms. The summary here um, outlines the take home messages. Lots and lots of genomic and epigenomic abnormalities. The key here, though, as opposed to lung cancer, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, and a variety of other tumors, you see very few high-frequent mutations. What I mean by that is mutations that are present in greater than 4% of the tumors. Two exceptions, P53. P53 is found in essentially 100% of the tumors, and BRCA1 or BRCA2, which you might expect, and that's found in about 20%. If you include all the Fanconi pathway, it may go up to as high as 30 or 40 percent. What you do find instead of mutations, like activating mutations in EGFR, what you find is multiple areas of chromosomal gain. These contain hundreds of genes. You find multiple areas of um, chromosomal loss. They also contain hundreds of genes. A lot of heavy, uh, hypermethylated genes. And if you try to take serous tumors and start to um, identify subsets of patients, it's actually fairly difficult. Uh, something we've done for a living is uh, transcriptional 
clustering patterns. You might be able to find a few. It's not clear it correlates with survival, and that's true for also microRNA. Here's some examples of some of the genomic output from Cancer Genome Atlas. This is actually a slide that summarizes the data during the actual project, so it doesn't um, show exactly all of the data. But the take-home message here is if you go across chromosomes, as you can see, there are lots and lots of areas of amplification, and many of these amplifications are extremely frequent, and they contain not just the suspected important gene, but in fact, lots of other genes. And so these are big amplicons with a fairly complex interaction of proteins and genes without a clear idea of exactly who's driving uh, the tumor. It's true for deletions. Again, you see lots of big areas of deletions containing interesting genes, but also uh, frequently multiple genes within the same uh, loss. This take-home message is summarized in this. I love to show this slide. This is a uh, spectral karyotyping. You probably are familiar with this technology. You paint a chromosome a certain color. You should have a color per chromosome, and what you should see then is a whole bunch of wonderfully looking chromosomes painted a solid uh, color, and of course you should see two alleles, two, two chromosomes per pair. Uh, what you're seeing here are several serous ovarian cancers. First of all, there's gross aneuploidy throughout the entire uh, karyotype. And more importantly, you're seeing modeled chromosomes. These have bits and pieces from other chromosomes, shifting DNA, amplification, and loss. This is, in many ways, I think, and lots of us think, a tumor of genomic chaos, which is probably produced by a severe abnormality in DNA repair, resulting in genomic instability. Now, there are some, some implications on this. Um, one is that subsets of high-grade serous uh, ovarian cancer essentially don't exist because there's so much shifting, or at least they may be very difficult to identify. And tumors are likely to adapt very rapidly. I think that's consistent with what we see in the clinic. And then um, ultimately, which I, I, I whisper, because certainly patients don't like this, resistance, drug resistance may be inevitable with this kind of tumor. Um, that sounds dismal, and some of my colleagues, including a former colleague who used to work here, uh, has said in a very public meeting that, in fact, we should not conduct any phase three trials with ovarian cancer anymore um, because uh, this tumor um, cannot be targeted. Um, I don't actually share that. I think we need to be a little smarter and a little more clever, and I'll give you a couple examples of how I think we can target this. Have to think outside the box, okay? This is a slow, this is a slow group here, okay? <laughs> Stay with me. Whoa. <laughs> okay. So, first of all, the, the tumor has a severe defect in DNA repair. Can we actually target that? And can we target that deficiency in the genomic instability? And I think you probably know a little bit of where I'm going here, and that is the new kids on the block, which have already been tested in ovarian cancer, showing some promise, which are PARP inhibitors. Um, so, PARP is a protein. I won't belabor this too much because you probably know this, but PARP is a protein, one of whose jobs it is to repair single-stranded breaks. If you don't repair single-stranded breaks, they ultimately become double-stranded breaks. Double-stranded breaks are a real problem for a cell because the replication fork stops there. The DNA cannot be replicated. The cell dies. So you need to have a very good system to repair double-stranded breaks. And in fact, we do. We have homologous recombination. That contains BRCA1 and 2, plus a slew of other proteins I'm going to go into. Um, if you don't have those, then you're stuck with non-homologous end joining. Non-homologous end joining is a desperation attempt by the cell to survive. It just sticks ends together and usually precipitates in massive mutation rates, which ultimately um, result later on in the cell in cell death. So, work done primarily by Alan Ashworth, but others decided and 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 hypothesized that in fact, if you develop drugs to PARP and you inhibited the repair of single stranded breaks, they would eventually become double stranded breaks. And if your cells couldn't repair double stranded breaks, i.e., you don't have BRCA one and two, the cell would die. And this is called synthetic lethality, which was not invented by Allen, but was actually reported 30 years earlier in simpler 
uh, organisms, but it was applied in a very elegant way, I think, to the problem of cancer. And he developed PARP inhibitors. Um, and through a very, very nice series of high-level publications, demonstrated essentially validation of synthetic lethality in the lab. Now, these agents have found their way into the clinic because they look like they're going to be of value. This is a uh, somewhat old slide, but saves, serves the point that there are multiple companies uh, working in this area. Um, I'll bring your attention to a Laparib. That is the... Um, a former kudos drug. Most of the data I'm going to show you comes from that. Um, Velaparib is the Abbott drug. Is They have a CRADA with um, CTEP, and that drug is moving along fairly rapidly. Also, the Pfizer drug is no longer Pfizer's. They have um, licensed it to Clovis, and Clovis is now developing independently. The BSI drug we've used here fairly extensively. It's probably not a PARP inhibitor. We're not quite sure what it is, uh, but we're working on that. And then there are a number of other companies, but the top four are really the big players. This is the phase one trial published in the New England Journal by Fong et al. using Olaparib as a single agent. And the take home message here, this is in a group of fairly diverse tumors, end stage, heavily pretreated, and you're giving patients a single agent, uh, which it turns out in that paper is relatively well tolerated with the exception of occasional cognitive dysfunction or a little nausea, no other side effects, you're seeing fairly impressive responses, both in ovary, breast, and even prostate, um, PRs, and a couple of CRs. So this was the initial excitement um, with this drug uh, in the clinic. That led fairly rapidly to the iceberg study, again, using a Laparib, AstraZeneca drug, in BRCA-deficient advanced ovarian cancer. They chose two drug doses because they weren't quite sure yet what dose worked the best. You had to have germline mutations in either BRCA1 and 2 and, of course, measurable disease. This waterfall plot, I think, sums it up very nicely. Anything going down is good, tumor shrinking. Anything going up is bad. Uh, I would point out to you that the vast majority of these patients have platinum-resistant ovarian cancer. The response rate in this tumor to other agents is about 15%. Response rate in this trial in these patients, remember their mutation carriers, is 33%. This um, really stimulated a lot of excitement and led on to the next trial, which I am told was really designed as a registration trial. It's randomized Olaparib versus what was considered to be standard of care, liposomal doxorubicin in ovarian cancer patients, most of the tumors are platinum resistant, who had mutations. Sound it reasonable. The best laid plans of you who know who go, go asunder because here's the design, two dose levels, 200 and 400 versus liposomal doxorubicin and a dose that none of us use, but unfortunately this is the FDA recommended dose at 50 milligrams per meter squared. Look carefully at the resist CA125, you don't have to worry about CA125, but look at the response rates here. The Olaparib at 400 has a response rate of 59%, that's very impressive. Um, it probably, and I know for a fact it's not statistically significant from the liposomal doxorubicin at 39%. Numbers are small, um, so there's no statistically significant difference. And in fact, if you look at progression-free survival, there is no significant difference between these arms. This was presented at ASCO to much fanfare. People were devastated by the result, and it was presented as a negative trial. This trial is, in fact, positive in my, from my view. And the reason is, is the problem isn't that Olaparib didn't work well enough. In fact, the response to liposomal doxorubicin is about 15 to 20 percent higher than we would have predicted. And what that means is a certain part of the biology that we should have appreciated we didn't, which is that patients with germline mutations with BRCA1 and 2 have tumors that respond to a lot of DNA damaging agents, including liposomal doxorubicin. So that response rate is actually higher than we thought. And Probably the trial should have been designed either against weekly taxol or had added uh, a laparib to a liposomal doxorubicin. The problem is when the company saw this, they basically decided not to develop the drug. Despite four or five years of clinical work and another four, settle down there, um, another four or five years of, of laboratory work. Um, and they certainly pulled out of the breast field, uh, but they announced they, they weren't going to develop this or didn't think they were going to develop it in ovary. However, um, there was an ongoing randomized phase two trial using Olaparib in maintenance 
in patients with platinum-sensitive disease. So this is an interesting trial. Um, you had to have platinum-sensitive disease. You had to have two pr prior treatments with platinum. Um, 400 milligrams was picked, which I think is, was a good choice, and, and it was placebo-controlled. This was presented about a year and a half ago with a fabulous result. Um, again, don't need a statistician to tell us this. Um, these curves are remarkably different with the upper curve being the elaborative um, maintenance portion of it. Uh, this has the most impressive hazard ratio I have seen in any trial in over a 0.35 with a p-value that has enough zeros that I can't follow them all. Um, so this was, a, this was a strongly positive trial. I will say that the overall survival data from this didn't show much of a difference, but this was interesting enough to rally the scientific community and the advocates within ovarian cancer, and AstraZeneca is now thinking very seriously about future trials. It's important to note that the benefit that patients saw in that trial extended over almost all groups. Um, and if you look at um, known BRC mutation, which is two from top, uh, they had a ha hazard ratio around 0.2. I'm now told that they've gone back and sequenced most of these patients, because remember, they were platinum sensitive, not necessarily mutation carriers, in that if you are a mutation carrier, the hazard ratio is 0.1. So it's strongly positive, and I think that, in fact, they are probably going to go to a randomized phase three trial using this agent. Uh, we're waiting to see. So the take-home message there is I'm not sure where where or when the PARP inhibitors will end up as uh, approved care, but my guess is they will. They will probably be tailored to um, true mutation carriers. Um, I, uh, there's a big push to bring them up front for the treatment of all ovarian cancer. I think that's a serious mistake, and I can discuss that afterwards if you're interested in knowing why. Uh, but they are uh, clearly an exploitable target in ovarian cancer. Now the question is, that's exploiting the DNA repair abnormality. Is there anything else that we can exploit in these tumors? And I think the answer is yes. So can we find something that is actually genomically stable in this tumor? And I think you know we can. It's not uh, rocket science. But in fact, all these tumors have blood vessels. And they're lined by um, genomically stable diploid cells. And I go back to this drawing that I showed you. It's starting like a different venue, different graph. But this, again, is the response progression-free survival of our 170Q. Um, and I've put in a uh, drug that I did include on the last one, which is bevacizumab. And notice that it's sitting up in that right-hand quadrant where I said you want it to be, way up here. It has a response rate of close to 25%, and progression-free at six months is about 40%. This was demonstrated by two, at least three studies, two major ones, a GOG-170D, and actually Steve Canestra's study right here at Harvard. The two study is a VEGF trap, which we think is a similar molecule. But the bottom line is, this is an active agent in recurrent ovarian cancer. Based on that data, this, tri this drug was brought into an upfront trial, uh, GOG-218, where they added it to chemo, both uh, simply concurrent treatment and then another arm showing 15 months of maintenance with bevacizumab. And the progression-free survival curves are shown here with the upper curve being the BEV maintenance arm. These are the other two arms, which are indistinguishable. There's a prolongation of PFS of about four months, has a ratio of 0.717, highly statistically significant. While we were doing that study here in the United States, the Europeans were doing ICON-7, which is essentially the same study. Uh, chemo is a control chemo plus BEV at a slightly lower dose, followed by BEV for 12 months. Very similar result, separation of the curves. In this case, the PFS prolongation is only about two and a half months, highly significant. Hazard ratio is not quite as impressive. But here's the caveat. If you look at the overall survival on both of these studies, I'm not going to show you 218, but I'll show you ICON-7, there's no difference yet. And I will tell you the 218 study has been finally analyzed. There is no overall survival difference, but I will tell you there's a 40% crossover between the arms. So patients who never got BEV on the trial got it later on. That may have muddied the water. In Europe, it's actually pretty hard to get BEV when this study was done. So it may be a cleaner study. The results will be available next spring, and it may, in fact, show a survival difference. Uh, it is somewhat ironic that the FDA has made it very clear that they will not approve this drug up front based on 218 study. The Europeans took the 218 study from America, went to the European Commun 
uh, community presented that data and got approval for the drug. So Avastin is actually available in Europe based upon our, our data. Um, let me finish on targeting endothelial cells with a trial that was just presented in ASCO, which is called the Aurelia study. This is recurrent ovarian cancer. Uh, chemo du jour, this is a classic European study, chemo du jour, chemo plus BEV, um, treatment to toxicity of progressive disease. And they limited it to weekly taxol, topo tecan, and liposomal doxorubicin. So in other words, they're looking at what benefit you get from adding BEV. Apparently none. Okay. Uh, baseline characteristics roughly the same between the two groups. Um, and I think a fairly impressive uh, prolongation of PFS shown here from 3.4, remember these are platinum resistant patients, they don't do well, to 6.7. Um, again, pretty impressive hazard ratio. And what I, I don't have the slide for, I can tell you, is you can break this down to the type of chemo they had. If they had weekly Taxol plus BEV, they go from 3.6 months all the way out to 12. And I think probably, maybe I hope springs eternal, but I think in the fact that subset will probably show an overall survival advantage. So adding BEV to chemo provides an advantage. Again, summation of this data, the response rates are, are very high. The summation of this data is that targeting ang angiogenesis in this tumor makes sense. It's effective. We just don't know what the best use of BEV is. I think there's a lot of work, including work in my lab, to look for the subset of patients who actually respond. It may not be everybody. There may be certain patients to do best. Um, a lot of work on what chemo works best with bevacizumab. As I said, there's, it looks like there's synergistic activity with weekly taxol. And then finally, the most recent cutting-edge work is using uh, other anti-angiogenic targets like ANG2 uh, and delta ligand 4, for which there are small molecule inhibitors and antibodies coming into the clinic, and we're using them in phase one combinations, um, which I think will be uh, uh, quite interesting. Okay, so are there any other stromal targets? Well, there's tons of them. Um, we already talked about endothelial cells, ANG2. Immune cells are diploid or in the uh, um, stroma. Chemokines, fibroblast producing um, CTGF, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of targets, here a target, there a target, everywhere a target, target. These cells are all diploid, not, met, not genomically unstable. Uh, and so although they may not be cured of, it's certainly the possibility of converting this tumor from a lethal tumor into one of a chronic disease. So let me finish up going back full circle to say, okay, we can target the instability, we can target the stroma. Should we abandon what we found in the malignant epithelial cells as genetic alteration? And I would argue, again, that's probably not true, but it's different than what we're doing in other tumors. We can't simply look for EGFR mutations. We have to look closely at these large amplicons. And the key is you need in vitro and in vivo data, I believe, to show which gene in the amplicon is the driver. And I'll show you real quickly work from my laboratory, um, which has started to sort of systematically look at these amplicons. So here's a paper we derived um, now about five years ago showing that there's a fairly large amplification on 5Q. It's strongly associated with poor survival. This amplification has multiple genes on it. If you look closely and begin to survey it, what you find is FGF18 uh, is uh, located and amplified. And of interest, FGFR4, one of the four FGF receptors, is located in the same amplicon. If you survey all of the FGF molecules, and there's a lot of them, in fact, the only one, this is uh, looking at in, this is looking at FGF uh, expression levels in 53 microdissected late stage tumors, the only one that in fact shows statistically um, increased expression in tumor versus normal and a very strong association in poor prognosis is FGF18. It's a prognostic factor if you go across databases. This is our database. This is the one from over at BI. If you actually look at the Cancer Genome Atlas, again, um, statistically significant across all databases. FGF18 FGF is overexpressed. It's prognostic. And what's interesting is that you can demonstrate in vivo now, if you um, transfect this and overexpress this, 
in tumors, in cell lines that actually don't make tumors, you have this massive proliferation of tumor cells, either in a sub-Q model or an IP model, strong staining. Uh, and in an in vitro assay, you can demonstrate that um, you get tube formation of endothelial cells by FGF18, and that correlates with what we see in the xenograft models, that these uh, tumors are actually highly vascular. In fact, some of them come out a little bit pink when you dissect them. This is what they look like. Here's a CD31 staining showing lots of blood vessels in the FGF18 expressing. And of interest, um, FGF18 data I want to show you feeds back on the tumor cells through FGFR4, the receptor in the amplicon. Uh, it then regulates NF-kappa B. NF-kappa B drives the production of multiple chemokines. Those chemokines are actually very important for the recruitment of tumor-associated macrophages, which pile up in the tumor. Um, and we think, in fact, are in the M2 form, which is promoting the proliferation of the tumor. So this whole autocrine loop and paracrine loop, because it's affecting the stroma, is driven by a genetic abnormality in the tumor on a fairly large amplicon. We think, in this case, the FGFR4, uh, FGF18 axis uh, can be targeted, and we already have molecules for it. So anti-FGF18 antibodies are available, but they're mostly research. But if you've heard of VEGF trap, which is a trap molecule that traps VEGF, there is a series of FGF trap molecules that have already been produced. Two of them are in early clinical trials, and we're in the process of, of uh, developing a clinical trial to uh, try to treat patients. And of course, the argument would be we would only treat patients who have 5Q ampl amplified. Um, other targets you've probably heard about, certainly PI3 kinase is amplified in about 20% of, of tumors. Um, AKT in about 10 percent. The folate receptor is interesting. Um, it is overexpressed in about 80 or 90 percent of ovarian cancers and already into phase three trials. Um, so I would say, despite my colleague who said in a very public forum that this is not targetable, I think in fact we have to be smarter than that. We can target the um, genomic instability. Um, we can target the parts of the tumor that are not genomically unstable. And then ultimately, we may have to sort of acquiesce to say, look, we may not be able to cure this, but if we could, through a series of longitudinal biopsies, identify amplicons which are evolving but present and design therapies for them, we can turn a lethal disease into something that is more chronic. And certainly, I know most of my patients would accept that. That's it. Thank you. Questions? Okay, Michael, uh, <clears throat> use of Avastin in gliomas. Oh, sorry, <clears throat> uh, use of Avastin in gliomas, hepatocellular tumors, there are uh, biomarkers like stromal derived factor that uh, once become elevated and can be, become elevated very quickly, predict no more response. Are there any biomarkers for anti VEGF therapy in ovarian cancer? Yeah, so that's. Yeah, I mean, other than the holy grail of early detection screening, that's probably the second holy grail at this point. Um, so Genentech's done a lot of work on colorectal cancer and to a certain extent on breast became, because it became more relevant in breast when they pulled back the uh, indication. Yeah, and I've seen most of that data. Uh, it's not overwhelming for identifying either a single biomarker or a combination of biomarkers to predict response to or resistant to BEV. One of the advantages in participating in GOG, probably the only advantage I can think of, is that I, I'm on that, I'm on 218, the trial 218. So we have about 2,000 plasma samples, and we have about 1,500 um, paraffin specimens. And so they're right now actually being assayed for, um, we think we're probably going to be doing um, AFI based uh, uh, FFP expression arrays copy number differences, and then the plasma is being assayed for the usual suspects to try to see if there's any marker that correlates with response. Don't have the data yet. But this should be available within a year. It's obviously very relevant to the patients and to the company. Yeah. I'm just curious that um, apart from the fact that we know quite a lot about the long-term effects of platinum treatment and almost nothing about PARP inhibitor treatment, so apart from this fact, why don't you think it's a good idea? Or you mentioned that. Yeah, treating up front. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, first of all, we've we've had about I would say maybe 20 years, now nah, maybe 15 years now, of phase three trials with ovarian cancer. 
um, dating back to 182, I don't know if you know, it was a five-arm study through every cytotoxic chemotherapy known to mankind in different arms. And there were no difference between the arms. The 15 to 20 percent of ladies who didn't respond, who don't respond to carboplatinum and taxol, didn't respond in that trial either. We now come into 218. If you look carefully at 218, the 20% of patients who don't respond still don't respond. So this refractory group we haven't cracked. Um, so one might say, look, if we want to bring another agent up front, we should be, we should be confident it's going to have an impact on refractory patients. Well, if you look at the phase two trials with Laparib, zero out of 14 refractory patients responded to the drug. So I don't think you're going to affect the refractory patients. Second point is, so you might say, okay, fine, we don't, we don't help them, but we'll help the other ones who respond. Well, so I would raise the question, I've raised this and almost been stoned to death, but if you think that, that PARP is inhibiting DNA repair effectively, single-strand breaks, we know platinum, among other things, makes single-strand breaks. So is, is this really fundamentally different than a dose intensity question? Point that at Dr. Chavner because he was there at the time. And we did dose intensity experiments out the yin yang for a long time and never really found a positive result. So that makes me depressed. And then if you add on top of that, this, rep this inhibits DNA repair. These ladies live four to five years. I can almost guarantee you you're gonna see leukemia. That's what, it, that's what it, so anyway, I, for that reason, I'm less enthusiastic, but nobody's listening to me. They're bringing it up front anyway. <laughs> I think it's probably better, I think there's really an indication for using it in germline mutation patients for recurrent tumor. That's a slam dunk. The companies didn't go there because I think the market was too small. Now, now they've got religion, they're, com they're coming back to that. I, the, the second issue is, is there a role for it in maintenance, like the maintenance trial I showed you? And I don't know the answer to that. We participated in that trial. We had two MDSs and one leukemia. Yeah. Michael. They were on trial. Yeah, you know, if you use carbo alone, you have a, what is it, about fourfold increase in leukemia by carbo alone. It's small, though, because you're starting with next to nothing. And I am a little bit worried about that. That doesn't mean you can't use PARP. We need to be creative about it. Remember, these patients are dosed continuously. Maybe you need two weeks on, one week off for your, norm, for your normal cells to repair. And then, and you'll get around it. I mean, these are all questions nobody knows. Bruce? Mike, let's talk about something really promising. What's this folate, the receptor? I <laughs> think you're gonna come back to that. I actually put that in. I said if I skip that, Bruce will have a seizure. Yeah. So actually, actually, it is quite promising. Um, so the folate receptor is overexpressed in about 70, 80 percent of ovarian cancers. It's actually overexpressed in non-small cell lung cancer and endometrial cancer, smattering of other cancers. It's not being exploited as a as a, a proliferation driving event. It's simply being exploited as a marker that's differentially expressed between the cancer cell and the rest of the body. It's not expressed on a lot of other normal tissues. So you have a great window. And the randomized phase two trial using what's called EC145, it's, a, it's not an antibody, it's a peptidomimetic which binds to the folate receptor, was linked to chemotherapy, it's a vinblastin derivative was done in platinum-resistant patients, that randomized trial was statistically significant for, for, for survival. They are now on to a randomized phase three. This may be the first new drug approved for platinum-resistant um, patients in, since Doxel. We don't know yet. Conjugate. Yeah. Like uh, the Seattle Genetics drugs, which is an antibody conjugate. Right, so the Seattle Genetics yeah. construct we have here, so that's the immunogen construct, yeah. which is an actual humanized antibody linked to uh, same, myozoid. Right. That, that so that's a, that's a trial that's a little earlier in development. It's a phase one, phase two. Mm -hmm. I think that's actually a better drug because it has better PK on it. Mm -hmm. um, that binds the folate receptor, is brought into the vacuole, the vacuole under acidic conditions, breaks the linker, right. the drug's released. That, that drug is about a thousand times more powerful than vinblastin, which is really what you right. need. Right. So you get both killing of the tumor cell, but also bystander effects. Right. You get excited about that? Yeah, See, absolutely. folate is not finished. It's always gonna be with us. <laughs> apoptosis, is, are, is uh, 
BCL2 upregulated? Are any of the anti-apoptotic genes vastly amplified? Yeah, and BCL2 has been around for a while. It is overexpressed in some ovarian cancer, um, some ovarian cancers. It's not amplified though, so I'm not I'm not sure how good of a target it's going to be. And, and, and the big question is, the other question is, what's the actual mo molecular mechanism for platen resistance? That remains really a mystery. Michael, uh, there's uh, some evidence that MUC16, which we know is widely overexpressed in ovarian, uh, is, is linked to oncogenesis, early data now supporting that. And, uh, and then there's the, uh, the antibody against MUC16 from Genetech. Right. What, what's your view on MUC16 as a target? Yeah, well, if you'd asked me about five years ago, I said, please, please spare me. I've heard enough about that. I think actually it's back as a player. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure what data you're referring to. I do know Dave Spriggs' data on um, uh, MUC16 has shown some very interesting biologic effects. Um, so I think that's interesting. It's not just simply a marker. It's actually doing something. And then the Gentrek drug, which is open here for trial, is I think quite interesting. They've had, we just opened on this side of the street, but in the um, dose escalation phase, they had a couple of PRs. So yeah. there's early, early evidence that there's activity and there's very little toxicity. Yeah, so. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, Mike. Thank you.